time for the Kim Hammer Show, where you'll learn how your state government affects you, your family, and community. Here's Kim Hammer. Good Saturday afternoon. Hope you're having a great Saturday, and it's, of course, watching your uh, watching your temperature with it being in the middle of a heat streak like it is right now. So I know you're being careful, and I uh, appreciate the fact that you are. So my guest today, and we're going to get right into it, uh, we're going to have a conversation about mental health. We've had that conversation before on the show, but... Uh, because it is at the forefront of a lot of discussions, I've asked two special guests to be on the show today. One is Representative Fran Cavanaugh and also Representative Deanne Vaught. Ladies, thank you all for being on the Kim Hammer Show today. Thank, thank you for having us. Okay, let's start off with you first, Fran, okay. uh, just so people can get familiar with the area that you represent and about you personally. I usually open it up for my guests to, especially representatives and senators, to just tell a little bit about themselves or their families or anything you feel comfortable sharing with the 10 million viewers of the Kim Hammer Show mm -hmm. uh, about yourself and about the district that you represent. Okay, um, I'm from Northeast Arkansas. I currently represent District 60, which is going to cover part of Lawrence Green, Sharp, and Randolph counties. Um, with the upcoming new districts, I'll be covering part of Lawrence County, Craighead County, a little bit of Green. So I change quite a bit in the districts. Um, but in this area, and mental health, as you know, is, is, is a major issue in all the parts of Arkansas. But I come from a family, and we have seven children. 13 grandchildren at the last count, unless somebody had one we didn't know about, but <laughs> and that's a possibility at yeah. this point, but no. So I'm uh, from a large family. Um, so I guess my passion for this is really because of my work with children, and that's really kind of where I'm getting um, my passion for this because we see this to be an issue that's really ongoing and gets more and more do we see it in children. And so if we can't stop it with the children, then it's just gonna to continue to get out of hand. And so that's a quick synopsis. Okay, Dan. So I am from Horatio, Arkansas, and I represent what is District 4 now, but will be District 87 whenever in January. Um, I have all of Sevier, all of Little River, and uh, the whole town of Derricks once the map gets changed. I've been working with mental health for quite a while now, even before I was elected. I actually um, am a sexual abuse survivor, and because of that, I realize, uh, I understand what it's like to be in those dark, deep holes and feel like you don't have anybody that really, truly understands. You feel like you're on an island all by yourself. That's the only way I can kind of explain it. And you don't realize that there's a lot of people out there who suffer through the same things that you've suffered through. Um, so I become very active once all my walls fell and I got the therapy that I needed to, you know, to get uh, the healing that I needed for the deep-rooted issues in which I had. Um, I started this project uh, my second term. I actually wrote legislation to try to do this, what we're doing now with the work group. And uh, it was referred to a subcommittee and that subcommittee really never met. I wrote it again and COVID happened. So we didn't ever really come together for this. And now it's amazing to see the number of people that we have in the room uh, working on this issue, which affects really every person in Arkansas, whether they want to admit it or not, they have somebody who is dealing with some type of mental slash behavioral health type issues. And for those that may not be aware, uh, Representative Vaught is head of the mental health caucus that has pulled yeah. together. And so let's start off by, by doing this. And to each of your personal comfort levels, you can talk about your personal experience and how that wraps into the mental health discussion that's going on. But talk about the caucus and just the concept of what the caucus is about, the makeup, who all's there. I've been attending the meetings, and um, so I know, but the public may not know as much. So talk about the caucus for a minute and the makeup of it. So I think whenever I first envisioned this, I didn't envision it becoming as big as what it's actually become. Um, I was thinking I might have, you know, 10 legislators in the room mm -hmm. <laughs> and pray for like some others to come in. Uh, but definitely it's been amazing to see all the different state agencies come together. Uh, from the onset of the first meeting, I told them that we had a lot of puzzle pieces floating around, but nobody knew what anybody was doing and it was time for us to put the puzzle pieces together to see what each agency is already providing in services. Um, and it was amazing to see the different people who didn't know what each other actually, 
what they their services were and how much the services overlapped. Um, I think we have to have more quality and maybe not more quantity of services. We've got to have better quality, and the only way to do that was to get everybody in the room and have everybody explain exactly what they can offer to our constituents. Uh, but that part to me has been pretty cool to see, you know, us outgrow an actual 20-member committee room and have to move over to, you know, Big Mac A, which is our biggest room uh, to serve everybody that's wanting to be a part of the discussion. Yeah. The, um, and Fran, you're on the caucus, or you come to the caucus meetings as well. Um, we've all hung around the Capitol a little while. It is really amazing that if you can ever get everybody in the room at one time, uh, what can get done just by communicating because there are a lot of s silos is the catchphrase or a lot of uh, you know individuality if you would you know where where there's not there's that disconnect and just getting everybody in the room finally to be able to have a conversation about whatever the topic is it's it's amazing you know what can get done uh, so let me let me ask you this um, and let's just start down a trail of, of topics on the caucus. Uh, talk about overlapping services. That's one thing, you know, that I've noticed is um, a lot of people in some ways are doing the same thing. The question is, are we doing it effectively, efficiently, and are we getting the best return on investment because of the amount of dollars that are being, and I know, Fran, you're a, you're a hawk of the budget. Yes. And um, <laughs> everybody knows that that sits in the budget meetings and listens to you. So let me ask you from your perspective, what about the overlapping of services and the effectiveness of using the dollars that we have? Just what's your perspective? Well, this was actually, we had our, our subcommittee, our rate subcommittee meeting yesterday afternoon, and we're talk, you're talking about the overlap of services. Well, there was a disconnect that we didn't realize was existing until we had this conversation and we had everybody in the room talking together. So when they start an evaluation of someone and it's determined that they have a DD, a disability, a development disability, that stops the whole mental health <coughs> evaluation. And then that person then has to be shifted over to another person to do something. And so when that happens, it stops the process for the client, which desperately needs the assistance. But beyond that, it, it creates another way that we're not using our money the most effectively to help those clients because the more effectively we can use that money the more clients that we're able to assist so while we're talking about this we're, we were trying to figure out ways that we could actually uh, stop that from happening and a lot of times they're finding out these children and we were talking about children in particular were diagnosed with autism in the middle of their mental health evaluation and so we're trying to think of ways outside the box that maybe we can have both of these evaluations in one place. So a child can be evaluated, and if it turns out to be that it's a DD, we don't have to stop. We just bring in the proper person that can finish the evaluation. And what that does, that once again speeds up the service to the client, but it also helps us save that money more effectively. And that's just one thing we found out yesterday. I mean, that overlap of services, if y'all know, is just, it happens every day. Um, and I think that's one of our biggest issues that we have to s try to think about is how do we get the biggest bang for our buck for the most clients that we can get in the state. And because there is a disconnect, uh, that's when people start falling through the cracks. Yes. Um, and, and, and we're going to be all over the place on this topic today because it's going to be hard to squeeze everything into the hours, so we'll, we'll kind of bounce back and forth. But, you know, one thing, too, is the stigma that mm -hmm. comes mm -hmm. with the idea of mental health, that if people come out and say, I need help, that there's a stigma that is automatically attached to them. That's one of the things I think that's becoming clear in the caucus meetings, too, is about how do we remove that stigma. Um, if I may, you know, yeah. you have personally experienced it yourself, Deanne, so yeah. talk about the stigma <laughs> and about the efforts to remove that label that is sometimes attached to people. And, and you know, the thing about it is, too, that label, once it gets assigned to a person, uh, it could have adverse side e effects too, whether even right down to being able to purchase a weapon or other things. So just maybe bring some personal perspective to it. So whenever I, the women of the house decided we were gonna do a video uh, explaining, trying to get more girls involved in politics, 
Uh, God quickly showed me. I hope that's okay to say that. God quickly showed this me. This is the Kim Hammer Show, <laughs> and God is welcome to every segment. And we're going to talk about God in mental health because that came up in the meeting the other that's day. Perfect. But yes. free liberty, and okay. my guests don't mind, and the okay. ones that do probably don't listen anyway. So, so okay. go for it. Thank you. Well, God showed me quickly that my uh, actual video was not going to be about trying to encourage more girls uh, to get involved in politics. It was going to be a me sharing my story about my experiences. I was sexually abused as a child. I have a reading disorder and I'm very ADD. I know you both can't believe that, but uh, it's definitely not evident. But you use it in a positive way. <laughs> yeah. Um, so anyway, so whenever I shared that story, at that moment, people back home did not know. My husband knew. Um, my mom and dad knew, my sister and my brother-in-law knew, um, but none of my husband's family knew, not any of them. So whenever I made that video, they first sent it back to me to preview, I was like, oh, if this goes out there, what will the stigma, I mean, I'm going to have a scarlet A on me, you know, like people are going to look at me differently and things could quickly go in a direction that I don't want it to go. and. Satan worked really hard on trying to get me not to share that video. But it come down to two girls, uh, both messaged me within about 30 minutes of themselves uh, that they were going to kill themselves. And I told, went in and told my husband, cr tears running down my face, um, I'm going to have to share this video. And it was before the house was even ready for it to be actually released, in honesty. Um, but I told both girls to please wait, give me 10 minutes. I was going to share something on my Facebook post. Please go watch for it uh, because I knew what it was like to be suicidal. I mean, I weighed 98 pounds before I got help. And a lot of people don't understand what it's like. I mean, I was dying a slow death, a slow suicide uh, because I didn't even feel like I was worthy of having a quick suicide, just to be honest. Um, Things can get really dark and you can get into a place really fast. And the old saying is, you know, sin can keep you longer than what you wanted to stay, take more from you than what you ever wanted to give. But mental health can do that same exact thing. It can take you down paths and roads that you never thought yourself to go down. And it breaks my heart because I can see people now who are in that same mentality that I was. And I told the Cecily in the house, I told her, I said, if this video helps save one person, then it'll be worth it. And that night it saved two. And they're both still alive today. They've gotten help and continue to get help. Um, it's a way that I never saw God using me. I never saw him using my tragedy, what I consider to be a tragedy that I was actually mad at him for for a little while that I even went through. Um, to, to help others realize that there is greener grass on the other side and that they too can get to where I'm at. I'm just an old country girl from southwest corner of this state. I ain't the smartest kid in the class, was never in any kind of anything, and, and God continues to use me today to try to help others realize that they're worth living. And they're, I mean, they were worth him dying for, so it's worth me doing everything I can do to make sure that they're, they do have a life worth living. You know, one of the things that was, and I, I'm, I'm the verse, Romans 8, 28, all things work yes. together for good for those that are called according to his purpose. And then I think about the scripture for such a time as this, yes. uh, you know, and then the scripture that God's timing is perfect, you know, that, that he would put people in key places and key leadership roles to be able to make things happen, utilize yes. personal experiences. And, I, you know, a lot of people think about the legislature and, you know, they have this perception uh, the other side of the legislature is that we do bring a lot of personal experiences from things, and when you put it all in the melting pot, you know, good things can come out of it. Mm -hmm. um, so on a spiritual side, I think that that's where God works behind the scenes to, to yes. put us in the right places. Um, let's talk about the spiritual side of things because that came up in the meeting the other day. You're going to have to help me. I left my brochure down in the car, but the gentleman from up there in Jonesboro or Paragool. Walcott. Okay. Outside in Northeast Arkansas, Walcott. Right. And children's home. Children's home, yes. that's right. Yes. And uh, and by the way, uh, you're talking about ADD. My, my mind runs a thousand miles an hour when I'm doing this. Sorry about that. Can we get that video? Would you send that to me and I'll yes, get it, I'll up, on my, it, get it up on my show page so yes. people, because I think people want to watch yeah. it if they haven't seen it. Yeah. Uh, 
But you know, incorporating spiritual principles into mental health services, uh, personally, I think that's a wall we need to break down. And some people are going to freak, you know, separation of state and church and all that stuff. But what about what about from a personal perspective and bringing spiritual principles into the discussion? Uh, how did that help you overcome? And and how do you ladies feel that including spiritual uh, values and principles into the discussion of mental health can have a vital role to helping somebody recover? Start with you first, Dee, and then we're going to you, Fran. I think you've got to do physical, mental, and spiritual to give somebody complete healing. And that's me personally. I had to have all three of those. Like I said, I weighed 98 pounds. I had to physically get healthy. Uh, actually, God got me pregnant whenever I shouldn't have been able to get pregnant, and I learned to eat again, and so I physically became. Well, spiritual and mental a lot go together mm-hmm. in reality, uh, but I had to mentally start changing the way that I looked at things. I looked at food. I looked at people. I looked at myself. I had to totally change. And then, the, you know, the spiritual side is uh, God shows up, and a lot of times he can show out even when we don't think he can. And a lot of people prayed over me, and a lot of people prayed for me during that time. I don't think I'd have been sitting here if I wouldn't have got all three, if I wouldn't have gotten that holistic type of healing, and that's just me. Sure. Well, and let me say something, friend, and then I'll come to you. But we are created in his image. Oh, yeah. You yes. know, when you go to the book of Genesis, we, yes. and the benefit, I think, of being a believer or at least looking at life as far as um, not the Big Bang Theory right. attitude, yeah. but, but we are created in the image of God, body, soul, and mind. Right. And so it only stands to reason where Satan is going to try to attack us is in each one of those areas. And, you know, I think that God's calling is for us to live as close to his image as we can. So it would only stand to reason that if Satan is going to try to win a warfare on the mental health side, he is going to try to prohibit people from getting access to the holistic approach of of being able to get that healing. Fran? Well, I mean, I don't know how anybody can go through without faith. Faith has to be a prominent um, part of anybody's life because that faith is what helps you overcome any obstacle. And with mental health in particular, when you're going down a wormhole and you don't see any light, the real light comes from that faith. And I remember early on in my life, I had lost someone close to me through, through a suicide, had lost a child. And so I went down a wormhole, a, a dark wormhole. And I always make the comment that it took me six months to figure out I was even down a wormhole. And so what brings you out of that? It's your faith. It's what you know. Personally, for me, it's what you know that God can bring you. I mean, he can show light. He can teach you how to overcome these obstacles. Now, may not be the way you thought he was going to teach it to you, and it may not be exactly what you prayed for, but he's going to show that path forward. And I think that's why you have to include that when we're talking about mental health and how to get through it. And, you know, people have different versions of faith, and, and, and we all understand that. But it's that faith in that supreme being, as some people call him, or as God, Jehovah God, that someone is able to believe in something bigger than themselves, bigger than the obstacle that we're facing one-on-one because we can't overcome many of these obstacles on our own and so it's that faith and knowing that we've got this ability of someone on our side much bigger than any of us that can help us get through that and I think that has to be part of it it has to be part of the conversation and bigger than the problem itself yes and bigger than the one who's creating the problem because I mean the reality is all these issues that we deal with um, in my opinion stem from from Satan or let's just say a sin but let's identify it as with Satan or the actions of Satan that have been imposed on somebody else to your point the end you know I you know he put he put something on you you didn't ask for nor anybody in your position would ever ask for um, and I've got a whole separate sidebar as far as what I think ought to happen to people like that mm-hmm. but uh, you know so so to think that we can overcome it ourselves through any totally just humanistic approach is going to leave a person short of what they can experience from full recovery. You were going to say something? No, and I think hope is another thing that I think a lot of people who are going through mental issues, they lose sight of, is they have no hope. 
they don't have that they can't grasp the hope that they can get better or that things can change or um that there but are there's people just out there light who at care. the end of the tunnel. Yeah. Or that, that that there's that hope. Yeah. There's that light at the end of the tunnel yeah. that I can overcome what has happened to me. And not only can I overcome it, I can thrive again. Yep. I mean, that's that's where that faith in God comes in, I do And believe. I'm the perfect example of yes. that. Perfect example of you can come overcome and you can do better and your life can get better. I think about the scripture, faith is the substance of things. Yeah. hoped for yeah. yes um, you know and it does take faith and I think you you know and that's that's part of what I think as legislators we need to be involved in and and that is giving people faith in the system that the system is going to provide everything or provide those things necessary if a person chooses to want to get help yeah. I got to take a break but let's pick up there when we come back um, what what does a person have to uh, do or how do you give a person the ability to have that spark of hope that if they're in a situation where they are struggling that they can you know feel as though there there's a place to go in order to get that help because I think that's something that we as legislators need to do now, I don't think we need to create a codependency you know on the government that that becomes long term but I do think that we need to provide you know the essential services in order to be able to do that um, I'm gonna go get go ahead and get ready to take a break but when we get ready when we come back from that uh, break let's go ahead and pick up there and we'll carry on some other topics you're listening to the Kim Hammer show you can go up to the Kim Hammer show dot com and uh, follow me on the uh, either on the Facebook or follow the uh, website we post uh, new and relevant material up there all the time uh, so you can stay in touch with uh, the Kim Hammer show dot com and we'll get the video that Deanne referred to a while ago up sometime soon so you can be following watching for it uh, come back here to 101.1 FM the answer the Kim Hammer show and after the break Welcome back to the Kim Hammer Show. Again, you go up to thekimhammershow.com in order to get a replay of this or go up to uh, my podcast platform, which you can go out to Spotify and Apple and all those others, and you should be able to find a replay of this show. And, again, we'll get the uh, video that uh, Representative Vaught talked about a while ago uh, up on the show as soon as we can. So let's go back to where we left off, and that is one of the things that I think we can be in agreement on is that we should – be able to provide people assistance or a sense of direction for where they can go to get help uh, through the caucus meetings um, would you think it'd be fair to say or am I overstating it that maybe some of the things we need to be working on is simplifying how it is that people can can find the help that they need and and part of the challenge I think is uh, you used the phrase uh, the acronym DD a while ago we've got multiple layers of people that have mental health issues from uh, the uh, people with disabilities or behavioral health issues. Uh, you've got people like Birch Tree down in Saline County and Mid-South up there in Jonesboro. Uh, there's so many different uh, uh, so many different breakouts. When we say mental health, it's not like you can just treat them all the same. No. So talk about what you think as representatives um, as far as what we should do to help make it easier for people to get access to mental health services. Well, one of the things I think been eye-opening to me is that we have to make it easier for them to get it. We have made it so hard sometimes for people who are in a mental health crisis to get emergency care that they need at that time. And we have got to find a way to cut through the red tape to allow these people to get the help that they need when they need it. They don't need to wait six weeks to get somewhere. They don't need to wait three days before they can get admitted in to see when they're in a you don't have that time. You just don't have that time. When somebody is in a mental health crisis, they need help then. They don't need help later. And we've made it to where it's almost 
sometimes impossible to get them the assistance that they've needed. And we've done that through regulations. We've done it through making it hard to have enough workers. I mean, when you look at the whole picture, we've really put on some regulations that when you step back and you look at it and you think, well, oh, that doesn't make any sense. Um, we're kind of like the old saying, cutting your nose off to spite your face in some of these issues. And we've got to cut through those regulations to get people to be able to have the help that they need. Just like you said, we don't want to create anything where somebody is dependent on government all the time. But my belief has always been there are certain services that the government is responsible for. And the care of our individuals, it, 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 that's part of ours. That's our responsibility. And we have to learn how to accept that, especially in mental health. We try to do it medically already, but mental health has been pushed to the backside. And we've got to bring that up forward because mental health, I, and I have said this many times, is one of the major crises the state of Arkansas is experiencing right now because the mental health crisis was evaporated by COVID-19 lockdowns. And so when we see this spike of issues with, the, with people with needing treatment for mental health issues, it's because we created it through all the restrictions and things that we had. And it just made it come to the forefront. It was already bad, but this just amplified it. And so we're experiencing that now. And we're experiencing it with children at a much higher level than we ever have in the past. And, and then we were talking about this yesterday, and they're very violent. There's much more violence in these children than we've ever experienced. And so how do we stop that? You have to do it through early intervention. So. All right, so let me ask you this, because we're all conservatives and I uh, believe we're all believers. Um, why are we so mentally sick? I mean, that's something I asked a few weeks ago I had uh, Dr. Kent Corso on from uh, out on the East Coast and the you know the question that keeps coming back up in my mind is an open range here why are we so mentally sick as a state why are we so mentally sick as a nation just from your perspectives I think we took God out of everything Amen. <laughs> Amen. I mean, in reality, yes. I, that is kind of you know the other thing is I think a lot of people a lot of kids are now experiencing more things younger and younger than what we did, any of us did at our age. I mean, when you think about the divorce rate, when you think about the number of parents that's in prison or jail, and the people that's having to raise them versus their own parents, or, I mean, we live in a society where both parents have to work now to actually survive in reality, and so kids come home to an empty house, whereas they probably came home to at least one parent when we were growing up, versus you know, coming home to nobody now. I think about, you know, one of my daughters, she taught in a very poor school district. And I mean, she was taking kids to the doctor. She was, their confidant was their teacher because one or both parents were in prison or they were drug addicts or the parents have their own issues that they never took care of. So our kids didn't get taken care of either. They're projecting their problems even on their kids, and their kids have more problems than what we probably did. It's probably. generational. Yes. It is generational. And that is, you know, one of the things, listening to the stories in the caucus meetings from, you know, people that come in with, with personal testimonies right. like yours, I think that as each generation revolves or evolves, that as each generation does, part of what I think needs to be part of the focus of the caucus representative thought is that we've got to address the society issues and, and what do we have to do to turn the tide? Now, I think the church, and I think God has to be in the middle of that discussion, and I would say this. I think we are where we are, and I would agree, is because we've pushed God to the side and the values and the principles. I think one of the things that we need to engage in a conversation of is how can we utilize the resources that are available and allow that as an option for people that want to exercise it to bring in those faith-valued uh, principles that I think really is going to help break the, the generational cycle. That's, I'm asking you, I think that's right. one thing we need to and throw I'll in the mix. You go back to the stigma. Yes. The stigma of it is I can't get help because even if, so if I go turn myself into the hospital and say I need help, I can no longer get my gun rights. So anybody who is like me that carries, you don't want to turn yourself in because you're stripped of rights because you were trying to get help. But the stigma around mental behavioral health is still, it's getting better, but it's still not to the point that people will go, okay, well, I'm mentally having a breakdown and I don't know what to do, where to go, or how to get help. 
because until it's too late. Up, until it's too late, because the stigma is still out there that, oh, you're taboo if you've got those kind of problems. In reality, if everybody would admit it, they have some sort of some kind of problem. What contributes to the stigma? I mean, how, um, in y'all's opinion, over the years, how has that stigma been attached to people? Because I think we got to figure out how it is that got attached to them in order to detach it from them and, and start backing it away. So as far as the process, you know, because for the people who came into the caucus and shared their stories, uh, that, that's a pretty big deal to come out yes. in public that's and big. say, this is my personal experience. Because there are those, and, and I think it is a cultural change of education that needs to occur so that when that, that we allow people to be able to step out and say, this is the problem I have without being saddled. So how, how do you think the stigma got attached and how would you recommend unattaching it? Well, I think it's generational. I think that years, I'm talking multiple generations, if you'll think as a society, we've always said, insanity runs in the family. Mm -hmm. So if you said that you had any mental health issues in your family, it was taboo because that meant that your whole family was tainted with this problem. And that's how generationally it started. And if you think about the way that mental health was dealt with early on, and we're talking in the 1800s, it was dealt with that way. Mm -hmm. And families kept it quiet because they kept them away so nobody could see them or know what was going on because they were so afraid because no one understood it. No one really understood mental health and mental illness. And, I mean, it's an ongoing issue that I think that that got ingrained into our belief system so hard that we have to get away from that because we understand now we're, we're smart enough to know that that's not the case. And there are varying degrees of mental health issues. And, you know, you have those that just need somebody to talk to. You know, sometimes they just have to work through a situation that they're currently experiencing. Then you got the ones that are, or like you said, they're in the middle of a, a crisis and they're looking at suicide. That takes something different. And then we do know that we have those people that do have severe mental illness that they're gonna have to deal with for the rest of their lives. And those people need to have the right type of treatment. But as a society, we put flags on them so many generations ago that it got ingrained in, in us as a society that, that we have to break that. We have to be, and how do we do it? I think you do it by people like Deanne, who's bold enough to come forward and say, this was my issue, I overcame it, and look at me, it's okay. And I think that's the only way we really do that is people have a, you know, a safe area, spot, should I say. I won't say a safe room, but a safe spot that they feel like they can tell their story and not be judged for it. The, uh, I think back to one of the caucus meetings, um, we had uh, a couple folks talk about integrated care, and you were talking about the severity. Part of the problem, I think, is that if people suppress it or push it down, the problem doesn't go away. Eventually, uh, it's going to it's going to come out somewhere. The question is, at what point does it come out, and to what severity yes. does it come out? Mm -hmm. To where somebody does something violent towards somebody else, or you know, some of the things that we see taking place in you know in the nation today. Um, I I would say I, I do believe in the integrated care concept that as we could catch them. The phrase was upstream. Mm -hmm. If we can catch them closer to the point of which they have that issue or they know they've got an issue that they just need to know you know get some help then then that would actually lead to savings greater quality of life a better society instead of them getting down to the point they have to be institutionalized agree disagree or what are your thoughts 100 percent yes okay um the model having sat through how many caucus meetings have you had now what about Five, six? six okay all right, and then there's the subcommittee groups. And just for the benefit of the listening audience, we never really got down into it before I moved on a while ago. But on the caucus, um, you you organized it just by putting out a blanket invitation, yes. started bringing in all the provider groups, and, and out of that it's just kind of swelled and grown. And now there are subgroups. Talk about the subgroups and what each one of the subgroups are doing just so people get an idea how the approach to and, – and we do need to talk about what is the hope of the end conclusion mm -hmm and what's going to come out of this productive that's going to turn into something meaningful and 
that will, will help. So go ahead and talk about that. So we broke it down into eight subgroups. Push your mic a little closer. I know you're very soft-spoken, oh, you know, quiet funny. and everything, but uh, and your phrase is how funny. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, we broke it down into eight subgroups um, from zero, age zero to 12th grade, access to special needs, um, we did suicide. We've done one that will focus in on the jails and the prison systems. We did rates. Um, I think you did one on, on manpower, didn't you? Yes, yes. workforce. Because workforce. Workforce. Workforce, we've got a huge workforce issue. Yep. But we just broke it down into these eight subgroups. And what I hope is these eight subgroups will develop legislation that can be um, all fit together like a pretty little puzzle. That's what I tell them all the time. So we actually have a good bridge from one side to the other uh, where people don't have to like search out how to get help. It, this will lay it out where they know where to go. I and mean, my hope is that each subgroup will have legislation that pinpoints that subgroup's needs. That's, that's the whole intent of it is that we can actually come out with something. I would like for us to be a flagship state on mm -hmm. mental health. This is, we are the state to look to, to how to help fix the mental health issues that's going on in each state. And I think we can do that. I would like for us to be that type of state that's at the forefront of mental health. And besides just being a little bit um, um, disconnected from each other, what are your observations after five or six? Uh, I've got mine, but let me hear what y'all's are. As far as what you see some of the, some of the specific problems are that are needing to be addressed well one of the biggest we'll talk about workforce we don't have enough counselors and uh, psychiatrists or psychologists we don't have enough of them and one of the reasons was brought out we changed the way people could get licensed and who could actually do it we took we took a bunch of people out of the workforce mm -hmm. so if we could fix that to where we could bring people back in because we didn't have enough to service what we already have. And so as we designed a system to go forward to accept more people, we've got to have the workers. So that's one of the king's things that we have got to first address is how do we get more quality you know, providers into this system so that they can help the most clients possible. Um, and one of the biggest things, well, I'll just say it, is what they get paid because a lot of the rates – we cut them so drastically in was it 2016 18. 18 that they can't keep providers can't make not just make money they don't even cover the cost to be able to provide the service and so we have to look at that and i realize as someone who watches the budget very closely but my my gut feeling on that is if we can't come to a, a rate where a provider can provide a service and we all realize that they've got to make a little bit because they've got to live, okay, and they've got people to pay. But if we don't pay that proper rate to that person, what happens is in the long run, we end up costing the state more because we don't get to that person until it's a crisis. And to have to deal with someone in a crisis it just brings the cost of it up, exactly. And you hate to be that way when you're talking about this, but as a state, that's what you have to look at. So the first intervention is going to be the cheapest on the state instead of having to deal with the, the major crisis that you're experiencing. And then on just another whole fact, if we can get them early on, then maybe we can stop some of the violence that we see because that loss of life that we're seeing from the violence, from the mental health issue, it, it's just escalating. So I ask myself every day when we talk about this, what's a human life worth? So that's why we need to think about that too. Well, sometimes it's not just a human no. life. It, it could be multiple, multiple human things. lives at one time. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, because uh, an individual doesn't get the help they need. Yes. The, uh, you know, the one thing you know, and put it out there for just thought processes is you talked about um, adding more people. The question, I guess, might be is are we adding more people or are we just identifying the people that have the needs out there that are already out there? They're just not. No, we're just identifying. They're out there. We're not just pulling them out there. They're, they're there. We have not been able to service them. But let me say this, too, and I'm going to get on the other side so y'all, devil's advocate here, okay. At the same time, are we, do you think, creating an, an issue regarding the subject of mental health 
and are we blowing it up bigger than it is because it's a catchphrase or because it is the popular thing that's being talked about now you know things come in cycles things come in wave uh, and some people and I've said this on the show before but you know y'all are deeply involved in the caucus or together on this but you know are people just trying to get on the bandwagon of mental health so that they can maybe get something out of it or because uh, you know to what level of severity does a person have to go before they actually are are having mental health issues just disciplinary issues and other things so I would say you have to be very careful I actually went to a conference where we talked about this you know you can't <coughs> say representative Kavanaugh aren't you experiencing this 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 <laughs> and this you've got to be you can't project it on somebody don't put the thought in their head if it's That's not right, there. if it's not there and I, and we do probably have some of that going on in reality I mean that's just the way this you know it, it works in every system yeah. to be honest and you're right. always gonna have bad actors. Yeah. 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 yeah and you're always gonna have bad actors but we got to think about those that truly need the help versus the bad actors to me you've got to if it's if I'm projecting it on her the therapist is gonna quickly realize she really doesn't have this issue if they're a good therapist they're gonna say okay look I think you're just going through a regular human type event in your life we all have adversities we all have these things that pop up you're it's just becoming an adult it's just this it's just that but I think there's a difference in something being projected on somebody and somebody having a true issue and I think if you're properly um, taught I think you'll be able to figure those things out quickly well and let me let me add out to that by saying this I think part of the problem in society today that is leading to mental health issues and this is where I think you get upstream and there's a question of where do you uh, interject this discussion you know you can do it in the you can do it in the school setting idealistically you got a good set of parents you know that are teaching their kids from from the crib till the time they turn adults the reality is uh, we are deficient in good parenting skills yeah. and I think that's being made evident by some of the outcomes that we're seeing in society today is because there's an absence of strong parenting skills in the home but coping skills just simple life coping skills that I think have disconnected mm -hmm. somewhere mm -hmm. in society are attributing to the growing mental health issues because people just don't have the ability to cope to that point I think that that COVID mm -hmm. you know has pushed that to the forefront right. I don't want to use it as an excuse but it has pushed it to the forefront that we're seeing the evidence that when we were kids if COVID happened you know we would deal with it we would suck it up we'd move on and we wouldn't use it as we would have been outside playing yeah, we would have been outside playing we yes. would use it as an excuse the way it's getting used right. or people becoming dependent upon that not right. that COVID's not serious because I've had it twice so right. I understand oh yeah me too but y'all's thoughts about coping skills or lack of coping skills and how that's attributing to the mental health issues well, they don't have coping skills they're not caught coping skills and I think as you said it talks down from the parents down but we know as a society we have the breakdown of the family unit and so with that breakdown of the family unit who suffers the children. the children and so the children they don't have both their parents involved in their lives and you gotta have you need a mom and you need a dad to teach you certain things because you learn different things from each one of them and so I think when we don't have that involvement in the family we're seeing what happens we are seeing what happens to the children how do we change that as you said it's a culture change as a government can we do a culture change I don't know it's really hard but what we have to do is try to find ways you said to get them upstream for these kids so that we can learn to try to get the coping skills in them and if that means just going and talking to somebody about a problem that you're having and they can teach that coping skill that helps them so when it happens again they're like oh I learned this so I can do that maybe it didn't come from the mom and dad because the mom and dad don't know it what you'd really like to do is get the mom and dad involved and teach the mom and dad coping skills so they then can teach their children sometimes that will work with the family unit but we let's face it sometimes it's not going to work so we've got to break that generational issue and so it's going to be unfortunately a lot of times that maybe we have to take a child and find a way to teach them those coping skills outside mom and dad and i think that is something that we have to work on and how do you do that because the other side of that coin is you don't want to get them dependent on the government taking care of them for the rest of their lives. Well, and I don't trust everybody in the government, present company excluded, <laughs> I don't trust everybody in the government to be the one to teach parents 
what what ought to be good parenting skills. Right. I think we've got to have a presence, but that is a slippery slope, mm -hmm. fine line that I think we guard against, and that is the government doesn't need to step in and be the parents. But I don't think we can ignore it. And, I, you know, I, I guess that's part of what I struggle because I grew up under, a, you know, I grew up in a good home. I had good, solid parents. Um, you know, I, I think some of my outcomes in life are attributed to the fact yeah. that I had that solid home life. The reality is there's a growing percentage that is increasing that okay. didn't have that benefit. And in the discussion of how we're going to deal with mental health, it's not only about the structure, access to care. I think we're going to have to have that meaningful discussion about what do we need to be doing and let me just say this it ought to be the job of the church mm -hmm. it, it really ought to be the job of the church to be out there in the communities and and being front line as far as uh you know making available um a better way than yeah. maybe some people are going now whether people embrace that or not i don't know you can't force it but at the end of the day what's going to end up happening is it is going to affect the government it is going to affect our nation our state yeah. our society and because of that, I do think we need to have this influence that, that the caucus is highlighting and bringing out. Thoughts? No, I think the church has failed in a lot of ways. This would be one of those ways is that I think we want to sometimes turn a blind eye to things that are happening to people behind closed doors. And we might know as the church, oh, they are really, really struggling. They come to church they don't really get what they need. They go back home, they still struggle, 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 struggle. We know they're struggling, but we're not handing out that hand. Of, it's a hand up. Let's start giving back. I mean, I think they used to do that, but whenever, give a hand up to a family who they know is in some type of crisis. We're real good if somebody's house burns down to have some kind of fundraiser and help them out that way. But when they're having a family member that's definitely having a mental breakdown or or a behavioral type issue, I don't think we're as quick to help those families in need. I think we don't know how. I think as a, yeah. I think but they they don't understand. They don't know how. They know it's happening, but once again, it goes to that taboo that was right. generational. But I think a lot of people don't know how to help those people, yeah. and they're scared to to make that offer because they don't know what's really happening. They're kind of scared, and so I think again, we got to break that taboo. We got to teach people it's okay to reach out to these people. And, and, and assist them if they can. And, the, and let me say this: I didn't. I don't mean to cast a blanket over the churches. Right, right, right. I do know, uh, like Living Well, for example. Yes. I'm gonna call that one out. You know, they are networked within right. some yes. churches. Yes. The church I pastor, we have it built into our budget that if somebody needs counseling, that we will help offset the count cost so they can go. I'll be honest with you. I got a degree in pastoral counseling, but I've also learned as a pastor. This is personal perspective. Not every pastor will agree with this. I, I give you acknowledgement of that um, but I think I think they need to be put hands in the hands of a professional Christian counselor that's right. going to give them holistic approach so like our church we have it in our budget that we help people that if they identify as a need because we want to get them in the hands of where they can get straightened out because life is too short to live miserable yep. yes it really is and and so I think in our discussions in the caucus one thing would be good is, is if we can figure out how the money could follow the need and not put up a barrier to people being able to access what they want, that if they want faith-based counseling, right. that they can get access to it. So I'm down to about two or three minutes, so let me open up the mic. I'm going to come to you, Fran, for about a minute. Any, any thoughts you want to share? I think, and I said this yesterday in our, our subgroup meeting, one of my passion projects is going to be trying to find a way that we can fund, maybe it's out of this one-time money we've heard so much about, um, the ability to have a place where we have these severely mentally ill children where they can go and get the treatment they need. We don't have that in the state. We have it for adults and we have places for children with some issues, but these severely mentally ill children, we have no place for them to go. And they're getting just, they go through the cracks, they're just lost. And those, unfortunately, are the children that we can see doing some very violent things. And we always say, when we see something violent, oh, they showed all these signs. Why didn't anybody do anything? Well, in the state of Arkansas, we don't have anywhere to do anything with those children. So I think we've got to address that issue, too. Okay. Do you? I will say I think we've got to start in that early, early age and follow those kids all the way through 
through high school and make sure that teachers are aware that this child might have this type of issue and give that teacher what they need to be able to cope and help that child. I also think we have a lot of people in our prisons and in our jails in which they really need mental health and not necessarily confinement like we do in a jail or a prison. So I think you have to take a two-prong approach and work from both ends to the middle to actually get everything that we need to be fixed in the state. But I have great faith in our caucus. And that's the value of a good assessment too. You can, you can kind of separate into needs as to where they go. Yes. Uh, so let me just say, appreciate very much what, what you're doing, taking lead on the, on the Mental Health Caucus, and I think it's gonna have some positive outcomes. Uh, got some other folks that are gonna come on in the next few months, so uh, I know by the end of the year, something will, will gel, yes. and uh, something good will come out of it. Ladies, I appreciate you being Thanks on the us. Kim Hammer Show. Us. Representative Fran Cavanaugh and Representative Deanne Vaught, uh, you can follow them look them up they're they're two great ladies i will give them <laughs> give them two thumbs up and uh one thing about it uh, you know where you stand with them too <laughs> I'm saying that. so anyway all right Thank you've me. been listening to kim hammer show you can go up to my website we'll get uh, d's video up there and hopefully you'll reach out and help somebody we have had uh segments about suicide prevention and uh, we're going to come back on that and also uh you know fentanyl is just uh, a so big yes. contributor to the illegal drug uh, creating a lot of mental health issues, so we'll have further discussion on that. All right, thanks for listening to the Kim Hammer Show. Hope you have a great day. Try to stay cool out there. Take care of yourself, and again, you can go up to thekimhammershow.com and uh, follow both on the information I put up on the website or go to the uh, podcast platforms, and you can get the show and share it, and I hope you have a great rest of the day. <laughs>